Boston University's 149th commencement is about to begin. Please rise as you are able.
Good afternoon. I am Rick Reedy, Vice Chair of Boston University's Board of Trustees. Uh, on behalf of our Chair, Kenneth Feld, and all the trustees and University Advisory Board members, it is my honor to declare the 149th commencement of Boston University is now in order. Now, I just learned from uh, Bob Woodward that uh, red only absorbs 82% of all the heat. Th thank you for that. Um, and just suffice to say, if anyone feels uncomfortable, if your robe isn't on, you still will graduate. It's not an issue. Okay, I ask that you remain standing for the national anthem to be led by Mr. Ryan Van Fleet, who, who is completing his bachelor's degree in music from the College of Fine Arts. And following the anthem, please remain standing for the invocation. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming on the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. The invocation will be delivered by Rabbi Jevin Eagle, Executive Director of Boston University's Hillel House, and thereafter, President Robert Brown will preside over the ceremonies. Hear our voices, Shema Kolinu. Hear our joy, hear our thanks. Scripture says, listen, O heavens, let me speak. Let the earth hear the words I utter. A story is told about an elderly woman listening to a lecture by a famous astronomer. The astronomer said, in around seven billion years, the sun will exhaust all its hydrogen fuel and begin the process of stellar death. When that happens, the sun will grow so large it will engulf planet Earth. Distressed, the woman interrupted the lecture yelling out, wait, when will that happen? The astronomer replied, six to seven billion years from now. To which the woman replied, phew, I thought you said million. Yeah, mom, I hear you, the teen answers her mother. Sure, you hear me, the mother replies, but are you listening? Many of us have been blessed with the ability to hear, but few of us have refined the art of listening. We are hard of listening rather than hard of hearing. Listening is not easy. Listening takes practice. Listening is how we show others that we care. It has been said listening isn't a need we have. It is a gift we give. Listening is something we do with our ears and also with our hearts. Our tradition tells us of King Solomon, known something rare amongst rulers, wisdom. 
When Solomon ascended to the throne, the young king was visited by God in a dream. Ask for anything, God said, and I will grant it to you. Solomon could have asked for beauty, riches, a long life, power. But Solomon asked for something far more precious and more difficult to achieve, a lev shomea, a listening heart. Listening is at the heart of all relationships that matter. Listening does not mean agreeing, but it does mean caring. A good parent listens to their child. A good teacher listens to their student. A good company listens to their customers and their workers. A good friend listens. Let us thank those who have listened to us and cared for us, especially our families. Let us appreciate that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. May we be blessed with a listening heart. Please be seated. Good afternoon, and welcome to Boston University's commencement exercises. It is a pleasure to welcome the graduates and, the guests, and their guests, and also to welcome those of you who are joining us, us via the internet. I now present Ms. Amanda Burke, who is receiving her bachelor's and master's degrees from the College and Graduate Schools of Arts and Sciences. She will speak on behalf of the class of 2022. Ms. Burke. Distinguished faculty, members of the administration, board of trustees, friends, family, and my fellow members of the class of 2022. I would like to let you in on a little secret. Ever since I was a young child, I have had a very embarrassing dream where others wanted to grow to be presidents or firefighters or, in the case of my roommate, a velociraptor. I wanted to grow up to be a commencement speaker. Don't get me wrong, I understand how silly that sounds. After all, commencement speaking is kind of a thankless task. Let's be honest. Some of you are dying for me to finish this speech faster and get off the stage, especially in this heat, and some of you are dreading it. But to me, this moment has always been fascinating. This speech is a five-minute inflection point between graduating and graduated. It floats in a period of time between before and after, with the whole world simultaneously spread out in front and behind. This speech is a speech at the crossroads of everything. And that is a daunting but wondrous thing. What do you say in a moment so full of potential energy? Do you use this time to reflect or to look forward? Because it is so, so tempting, standing in this incandescent moment of pause, to use this time to focus only on what is in front of us. You see, when I imagine life, I imagine it as a series of mountains. Each of those mountains are of different sizes, and each represents an obstacle to be surmounted. Right now, the mountains in front of us loom very large in our horizons. For some, that mountain is the workforce or service. For some, it's travel, grad school, or simply taking some time for ourselves. Whatever that peak may be, I think it's fair to say we are hyper-focused on it. And don't get me wrong, that is a very good thing. In a sense, that is what BU has taught us to do. During my time here, I was lucky enough to be the president of one of Boston University's most intensive, cutthroat, hyper-competitive student organizations, the Boston University Board Games Club. <laughs> Some of you laugh, but Board Games Club is no joke. I sat in the GSU every Thursday for four years, 
I watched my friends get way, way too into games of Monopoly, and I found myself. I found a support system, I found a community of lifelong friends, and I found a deep desire to prove to those friends exactly how far I could go. I'm sure every one of you has your own board games club, whether it is a professor, a team, an acapella group, or an honor society. You have your own terriers that inspire you to reach higher heights, to always seek out bigger, taller mountains, and give your community an even greater reason to be proud of you. We are a class that holds ourselves to a standard of excellence that BU has fostered within us. We are a generation that is always looking forward. But from my vantage point at the crossroads of everything, I want to challenge you to do something unbelievably difficult. I want you to take just a moment to look back. Take a deep breath. Fix your posture, because I've sat behind you all in classes and I know that you're slouching. Close your eyes and imagine you are standing on that windy peak, the shadow of the next summit falling cool upon your form. Then see yourself turning 180 degrees and see the mountains spread out behind you, an unbroken chain of ridges you have already climbed. Now open your eyes. You have beaten 8 a.m. lectures in Questrom when you live in West, the tea is late, and the BU shuttle has passed you by. You have crossed the BU bridge on days so windy you are walking on a literal 45 degree angle. You have shuffled, bleary-eyed out of Warren Towers when the fire alarm wakes you up in the middle of the night for the third time. And you have argued about buildings built in our horizons that may or may not look like games of Jenga. As the Board Games Club president, I can put this to rest. It does. And you have lived through history in innumerable ways. You demanded the world wake up to racial injustice. You repudiated a culture of gendered violence. You stood firm against attacks on the rights of our trans and gender non-conforming siblings, parents, and friends. And you took a global pandemic in stride. Our four years at BU were perhaps the hardest four years any class has experienced. But when things were dark, when the road seemed too steep or too narrow, we kept fighting anyway. We showed ourselves that there are always positive choices left to make. We were loud, we were bold, and we did not let the world forget we existed. Class of 2022, my five minutes are almost up. A young girl's dream of being a commencement speaker has been accomplished. I stand before you now in a liminal space between old dreams and new ones. I stand before you now at the crossroads of everything. And if I can leave you with one single thing from this moment, let it be this. When you are overwhelmed by what is to come, take a deep breath. Imagine turning 180 degrees See the mountains behind you. Each of those peaks was once the largest you had ever climbed. Many seemed totally overwhelming in their turn, but you overcame them all. Someday, this too will be one of those mountains behind you. So take a moment to appreciate your own strength and all the people who have supported you on your ascent. Breathe, and when you're ready, take that first difficult step. We know that whatever challenges await on our horizon, we will use our time at BU and the lessons we've learned here to drive us forward. We have already collectively overcome so much, and we will go so much further. Thank you, and good luck on your climb. Thank you, Ms. Burke. I would now like to call upon Ms. Victoria Bond, a senior from the College of Arts and Sciences, and Ms. Julia Willett, a senior from the College of Communication. Thank you, President Brown. Just Victoria, not Miss. Um, as members of the class of 2022, 
We've come together through the Class Give campaign to support student groups, scholarships, and campus initiatives that make tangible and important contributions to our community. For through our campaign, philanthropic gifts from the Class of 2022 combined to collectively support over 265 schools, colleges, clubs, teams, and other causes across BU. While a single contribution might be small, our collective impact makes a real difference. The Center for Sexuality, Gender, Sexuality, and Activism, Healthcare for the Homeless, the Center for Anti-Racist Research, and scholarships benefiting the next generation of Terriers are just a few of the many causes that have felt the impact of our class this year. <laughs> Your generosity has made so much on campus possible. Gifts from the class of 2022 provided funding for Delta Kappa Alpha to award scholarships and produce student films. For our women's ultimate Frisbee team, to compete in their first national competition. <laughs> for students, for reproductive freedom, to install a contraceptive vending machine. <laughs> and so much more. In total, 1,724 undergraduate, graduate, and professional students participated in the class gift campaign, and we cannot thank you enough. President Brown, fellow classmates, and Boss University's newest alumni, it is my pleasure to present the 2022 class gift of $34,293. Thank you, Ms. Bond and Ms. Willets, and thank you, the class of 2022. The class gift is a tangible expression of your commitment to Boston University. This commitment began when you first enrolled as students and is confirmed today as you move into the ranks of alumni. In the life of a university, faculty come and go, presidents come and go, but alumni are its constant the unending link of its past, present, and future. I am now pleased to present Anthony Harrison, president of the Boston University Alumni Council, who will speak to you on behalf of the Alumni Association. Mr. Harrison. Thank you, President Brown. Congratulations, you've done it. You are now about to join an amazing troop of people known as the BU Alumni Association. I am Anthony Harrison, and I am privileged to be the president of that group. It is so exciting to see all of you here and to welcome you into this amazing group of people, a group of people that comes from every state in this country and many, many countries around the world. 350,000 Terriers worldwide, and you are now part of that. What we are is this incredible safety net for each other. We have so much in common, more than you can imagine. Just like you, I sat on this hot field many, many years ago, basking in the glory of finally doing it because I wasn't really sure I was gonna make it. And so it just felt good to be here. But what I didn't know at the time was that there was a legacy of people who had come before me who were ready to help me once I left this campus, that were ready to share their experiences, and that we had more in common than we anticipated. Just like many of you, I lived on this campus in Danielson Hall. I ate my meals in Miles Standish before it was renovated. I was an RA in the towers on Bay State Road and an RA in 700, which we now call Warren Towers. I drank at the BU pub, I hang out on the BU beach on the first nice day, and I worked a ton of crazy and random jobs to, uh, to be able to afford all the beers I needed to get me through my midterms and finals. Those experiences 
will always bond you to every terrier that you will run into in your life. And that safety net is here to help you. It's a reciprocal relationship. At the beginning, you may not be able to give much. You may take, you may ask for advice, you may ask for counsel. That's okay, because your time will come and you'll be able to share, just as I have shared and my colleagues have shared. And that's when it really starts to feel good. You should never feel you're alone, whether you're heading home to chill for the summer or whether you're moving to a new city to take a new job. There are terriers everywhere, and I encourage you to find them because they're here to help you and they want to help you. And it's a proud group to be part of. I'm looking forward to seeing what each of you brings to this association as you grow and mature and get involved and you start to share your experiences with each other. I'm excited to be part of this. I'm excited for all of you. Congratulations. Enjoy this moment. It's very, very special. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Teaching is an art. It is also one of the most important functions of a university as it helps to mold the next generation of informed citizens and creative thinkers. The late Dr. Arthur G.B. Metcalf, an alumnus, faculty member, and trustee, founded and endowed the Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching at Boston University to recognize great practitioners of this art. Candidates for the award are nominated by members of the Boston University community and a committee of faculty and students then submits its recommendations to the university provost and to me. It is indeed difficult to select a winner of the Metcalf Cup and Prize because all of the candidates are outstanding. One finalist in the competition will receive the Medcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Will Dean David Chard of the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development please present the winner of the 2022 Medcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. President Brown, it is my honor to present Dr. Leslie Dedecker, recipient of the 2022 Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Leslie Dedecker, Associate Professor at the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development, is on what some may say is a radical mission, to prove to high school students that math is not just necessary and useful, but provocative, exciting, and super cool. Disrupting conventional wisdom and reimagining the world of learning is at the heart of Professor Dedeker's pedagogy and mentorship. Drawing on her deep experience teaching math in a San Francisco public high school, she is training America's teachers to provoke curiosity and engagement and reach out to all students. Take her popular mathematical tours which she helped develop with colleagues and doctoral students over the years, where she brings students into Boston and challenges them to make mathematical connections to their surroundings, determining the percentage of city land devoted to green space, or comparing the length of the Boston Marathon course to the number of trucks used in the big dig. Student evaluations are studied with compliments such as enriching, inspiring, and rigorous, but thought-provoking appears most frequently. The selection committee praised Professor Dedeker's ability to seamlessly move among discussion of research papers, active learning, and group-based problem solving in her classes, and noted her, her mastery of classroom management that encouraged students with diverse backgrounds to engage with the class. Professor Dedeker has earned numerous grants and awards, including a prestigious career grant from the National Science Foundation, and leads professional development for school districts in Greater Boston. But most importantly, she inspires those who will educate the next generation of our STEM learners, today's doers and makers. 
We are, we are honored to present Professor Dedeker with the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Will Dean Angela Onwachi Willig of the School of Law present the winner of the 2022 Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching? President Brown, I have the honor to present Constance Brown, recipient of the 2022 Metcalf Cup and Prize. Constance A. Brown, a clinical professor at the School of Law, draws inspiration from her grandfather's life. He was born in jail and dispatched on an orphan train to rural Maine to work as a farmhand. Through grit and determination, he graduated from college and became a beloved doctor. His commitment to others was at the core of his being, she said. Clearly, such devotion is hereditary. In her four decades at Boston University, Professor Brown has been instructing, mentoring, and inspiring law students. But as she routinely demonstrates, teaching and learning are one thing. Doing is quite another. A hallmark of Professor Brown's pedagogy is hands-on training. Her civil lit litigation and justice program, for example, sends students into Boston courtrooms to represent indigent and marginalized clients in matters ranging from housing accessibility to disability rights, instilling the values of serving the community. Numerous graduates have taken this lesson to heart as they have become judges, prosecutors, public defenders, and civil litigators. As her dean says, Professor Brown turns theory into real law with real results. A former put, student put it another way. Professor Brown does not just integrate social justice teachings into her work, her work is social justice. Professor Brown has indelibly shaped the school of law with her incisive writing courses to the innovative lawyering lab, to her popular seminar and effective and ethical depositions. Despite an exceptionally heavy teaching load, she garners rave reviews year after year, including one that noted her unmatched commitment to every single student, every single client, every single lesson. We are honored to present Professor Brown with the university's highest teaching award, the Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching. We will now present the candidates for the university's honorary degree. Award-winning filmmaker, documentarian, and theater director Frederick Wiseman was to receive an honorary degree. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us today. We wish him well. Will trustee Antoinette Leatherberry escort our honored guest to the podium? President Brown. Trustee Leatherberry. President Brown, I have the honor to present Gay McDougall for Boston University's honorary degree. Having grown up in the South during the Jim Crow era, you know the pain of being seen as less than but you also knew there were cracks in the system, places where the light got through, and it illuminated your path to seek change. You were called upon to desegregate an all-white college by yourself. You registered first-time black voters after passage of the Voting Rights Act. You traveled through the South with the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights to identify viola violations. Those experiences led you to Yale Law School and a career as a civil rights lawyer. 
But racial discrimination is not only an American problem. So you made your way to London, where you earned a master's degree in public international law. From there, you joined the African National Congress of South Africa to help decolonize that country. For the next 15 years, you courageously told to free jailed political prisoners and later helped administer South Africa's first democratic elections in 1994, which established Nelson Mandela as president and ended apartheid. You have made an impact with decades of human rights work through the United Nations and have received numerous recognitions, including a prestigious MacArthur Fellowship and South Africa's National Medal of Honor for non-citizens. But you have remained as steadfast and passionate about the right to be seen and valued as you were the day you bravely stepped forward on the campus of Agnes Scott College in Decanter, Georgia. Gay McDougall, we thank you for your vision and courage and profoundly, uh, proudly confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Law Honoris Causa. Will Trustee Michael Frickless escort our honored guest to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Frickless. Mr. President, I have the honor of presenting Mr. Richard Shipley for the university's honor. Having founded a venture capital firm that invests in emerging technologies, you are accustomed to seeing things others do not and then you turn your vision into reality. When you saw how skillfully Boston University faculty adopted online tools to reinvent teaching during the pandemic, you envisioned a center dedicated to digital learning and innovation. Then you made the generous gift that opened its doors. This is not the first time you've seized the future by pioneer, uh, partnering with your alma mater. In 2016, you opened the Shipley Prostate Cancer Research Center at the School of Medicine. As a survivor, you wanted to give patients ready access to the latest information about personalized and minimally invasive care. You earned your bachelor's degree and MBA with highest honors from the Questrom School of Business. That foundation served you well as you rose to lead the Shipley Company, a world leader in circuit board technology and semiconductor manufacturing that your parents started in their basement. By the time you oversaw its merger with Roman Haas in 1992, the company employed 1,000 people and posted annual sales of $200 million. For 14 years, you served on the Board of Trustees, then on the University Advisory Board, and now you are a trustee emeritus. Through your enduring devotion, splendid gen generosity, and acute strategic vision, you have sh helped shape this institution into one of the great research universities of the world. And for that, Boston University is forever grateful. Dick Shipley, we proudly confer upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Will Trustee Amas Fakahani escort our honored guest to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Fakahani. Mr. President, I have the honor, distinct honor, 
to present Mary Lou Scudders for Boston University's honorary degree. You were 15 years old when you cared for your ailing mother during her final months of life. Her battle with depression marked your youth and gave shape to your calling, social service and mental health advocacy. Your next stop was Boston University where you received your bachelor's degree in psychology cum laude and a master's in social work. Ever since, you have worked tirelessly in the public and private sectors for, for society's most vulnerable. So it was no surprise when Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker enlisted you to serve as Secretary of Human Services in 2015. You have since reformed the child welfare system, confronted the opioid epidemic, and strengthened community-based programs delivering essential services to one in three Massachusetts residents, all while overseeing 12 agencies with a combined budget of $26 billion and 22,000 employees. A staggering set of responsibilities. And then COVID-19 struck. Your nimble pivot and clear-eyed leadership during a public health crisis has been critical to the success of the Commonwealth as well as to Boston University in combating the, combating the pandemic, saving lives, and reducing suffering. You bring knowledge, integrity, and most importantly, compassion to the fields of social work and public health. Mary Lou Sutters, we are proud to call you an alum and honored to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Law Honors Causia. Will Trustee Rick Reedy escort our honored guest to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Reedy. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Robert Woodward for BU's honorary degree. <laughs> Bob Woodward. Your name has become synonymous with hard-hitting journalism. But when you first applied to be a reporter at the Washington Post in 1970, you failed the two-week trial. But you persisted, and a year later you were hired. Your reporting has done credit to the paper and your profession ever since. Just a few years after your first byline in the Post, you and your colleague broke one of the biggest stories of the century, the Watergate scandal, which led to the resignation of an American president. Your fearless pursuit of the real story has marked every turn in your long career and resulted in the sharing of two Pulitzer Prizes, along with almost every other honor in journalism. While remaining on the staff of the Post, you authored or co-authored more than 20 books examining the highest levels of government. Time Magazine called your first book, All the President's Men, written with Carl Bernstein in 1974, perhaps the most influential piece of journalism in history. Your three most recent books explore, explored the presidency of Donald Trump. Each is a New York Times bestseller. You have not only reshaped our media and political landscape, but you've also inspired generations of reporters eager to expose corruption and wrongdoing. Today, as the foundations of our democracy are being rocked by social, societal division, viral misinformation, and when it all costs politics, you still live by the ideals that shaped your career, truth and fairness above all. Bob Woodward, we're honored to prevent, present you with the degree Doctor of Law Honors Causia. I, 
I now call upon Bob Woodward to deliver the 149th commencement address of Boston University. Thank you. You are uh, very generous to ask me to be with you here today. Uh, I am very sympathetic to all of you sitting in the sun because we're not. So I'm going to cut some of this and try to go uh, to the essence. You're only encouraging me to cut more. <laughs> when I sat where you are, uh, graduating from college in 1965, that was 57 years ago. Don't do the math. <laughs> but at the time, the war in Vietnam had begun to escalate dramatically. I had attended college on a Naval Reserve Officer Training Scholarship, so I knew I could be sent to Vietnam, a war, quite frankly, I despised. But I did not know what to do, and I was disappointed in myself. Being disappointed in yourself, as you may have found out, one way or another, is no fun at all. Lots of smiles of recognition here. And when you're disappointed in yourself, you either paper it over or face it or come up with some compromise. It's a very unsettling feeling. During the final year of my service, I was assigned to the Pentagon. I saw the top secret reports of the massive bombing campaign in Vietnam using napalm, Agent Orange. You may have seen these in your history books. The reports I showed uh, without ambiguity said there are 500 sorties each day and only a handful hit their targets. But publicly, President Nixon and the admirals and the Secretary of Defense and the generals hailed the bombing as a great success. It was a lie, a big lie. As we know now, Vietnam was a spectacular failure. But I continued in my role in the Pentagon to do nothing. This was before Daniel Ellsberg had leaked the Pentagon Papers, the full history of the Vietnam lies. I had no documents and only the story of a long series of lies that I had personally observed. I always thought when I got out of the Navy, I would be free of lies. I would become a lawyer. <laughs> My father was a lawyer, a judge in Illinois at the time. I had been accepted into law school and there was a sense of inevitability as I coasted toward the next decision point in my life. I was drifting, though my life, uh, I really internally felt I was acting with calculated precision. Uh, I was 27. If I went to law school, I would graduate at age 30. As only you can know, age 30 is the end of life. <laughs> So I searched for alternatives. The question I was mulling was, what did I really want to do? I asked for an application to work at the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, but I never filled it out. I applied for business jobs, including with Procter & Gamble, the corporation known for its household and food products. My girlfriend at the time joked 
that I was going to wind up being Mr. Jiffy Peanut Butter. Each morning during this period of real personal turbulence, what road would I take? I picked up the Washington Post from my doorstep and I was reading through the hard-charging, intrepid articles. I thought maybe I'd like to be a reporter. Astonishingly, the Wash I had no experience in journalism in college newspaper. I went in and said I'd like to be a reporter and there was a collective laugh and astonishingly also they gave me a tryout. I loved every minute. I felt it immediately. The goal, let's find the truth, the best obtainable version of the truth. I guess it was like it love at first sight for me. I wrote a dozen stories or fragments of stories. Not a single one was published to my d deep disappointment. You don't know what you're doing, the local editor said to me, bringing my tryout to an abrupt and embarrassing termination. Thank you, I said. The editor was confused. You failed, he said. Why are you thanking me? And I said, because I know this is what I want to do. I was enthralled. The energy and sense of immediacy in the newsroom was overwhelming. I got a job at a small weekly newspaper in the Maryland suburbs at $115 a week. I called my father, the judge, to give him the news. I was abandoning law school. His response, you're crazy. Now I knew I might be on the right track. <laughs> Parental approval, something we all seek, but also in a very sometimes confounding way, parental disapproval. So over the next year at this paper, I wrote many stories. I was hired back at the Washington Post and initially signed the night police beat from 6.30 p.m. at night till 2.30 a.m., an eight-hour shift, 2.30 a.m. the following day. I loved the work even more. The police were a reservoir of good stories. I had been at the Post nine months when I was called on a Saturday morning, June 17, 1972, 50 years ago. And I was asked to cover a break-in at the Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate. The early morning editors at the Post had wondered who would be dumb enough to come in on this beautiful weekend to work. They immediately thought of me. <laughs> I would work any assignment. I would work the police shift for eight hours, sleep some, and then come in the next morning and uh, I love journalism. It was the opposite of the containment of life in the Navy. The next day, after the Watergate burglary, Carl Bernstein and I wrote our first story together about Watergate. It turned out a breathtaking string of lies. More than two years later, President Nixon resigned because of the Watergate scandal. I'm not sure there is an exact lesson from this path, but I have one suggestion. Don't be in a hurry to do what might be the wrong thing in your life. How do you prevent that? I think it's possible. Consider all the alternatives. Don't be afraid to try new things maybe even Mr. Jiffy Peanut Butter. Focus on what you're interested in. Don't choose the safe road. 
Some paths may sound crazy to others, even your parents, your guardians, but it might be the right path for you. You get to make your own mistakes. Don't be afraid of my mistakes, your mistakes. My father, a Republican, until the day he died, still thought I was crazy. <laughs> Parental consistency, one craziness to another. I would like to spend a moment to dwell on the role of imperfection in many human endeavors, most specifically my own mistakes. It is a cliche, but I think you will find it true that you learn from mistakes and failures more than success. And I think you will get to grasp that if you already not, uh, have not done that. I now have cut five pages from my speech. <laughs> the main story I want to tell is how you can be so sure you're right, sure you're doing the right thing, that you've made the right judgments, and maybe you haven't. And you sometimes have to change your mind about yourself and others. One of the stories that is stuck in my head all these years, and I hope never vanishes, it goes back to September 1974. Nixon had resigned the month before, and Gerald Ford, who'd been vice president, was elevated to the presidency. So a month after being in office, Ford went on television early on a Sunday morning announcing he was giving Nixon a full pardon for Watergate. It was a shock to many in the country. For a while, I thought Ford chose to go on television hoping uh, on, and he chose to do it early on that Sunday morning, uh, hoping that no one would notice. He could kind of sneak it through. Uh, but it wasn't noticed by me. I was asleep that Sunday morning. But Bernstein was awake. He called me, Carl, then and still has the ability to say what occurred in the fewest words, the fewest words possible with the most drama. He said, Mr. President, may I quote my colleague? So he said, have you heard? I said, I haven't heard anything. I was asleep. Carl said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. I felt really good that I was able to figure out what had happened. <laughs> I remember thinking, that's perfect. It's the final corruption of Watergate. Nixon gets a pardon, doesn't have to account for what he did, no jail time, and Ford gets the presidency. There was the stench of a hidden deal in all of this. It was denied, of course, but if you look at the history of American politics, Ford lost two years later in 1976 to Jimmy Carter because of the pardon and the intense suspicions about it, that there was a deal. At the time, I was convinced it was corrupt. But 25 years later, if you live that long, it's great to re- examine what you have reported on. And I decided to do a book about, uh, called Shadow, about the legacy of Watergate in the presidencies of Ford through Clinton. I'd never met Gerald Ford, never interviewed him. I called him up and said, I'd like to talk to you about the pardon. I figured he would say, oh, well, I have a golf tournament. I can't do it. But it turned out that Gerald Ford was probably the most open, direct, 
and honest person I dealt with in American politics. I ended up uh, in this research 25 years later after Ford had become president trying to excavate the history. What happened? What did it mean? Why was there a pardon? On my last interview with Ford in his bungalow home in Rancho Mirage, California, I asked him again, why did you pardon Nixon? He smiled, you keep asking that question. I told him, I do, because I don't think you've answered it completely. And to my astonishment, he said, you know, you're right. I've never told the full story. It's been hidden. I haven't even told Betty, my wife, what happened. And so here, we're in this his little cluttered office, 25 years after he had assumed the presidency, and tape recorder going for history. And uh, he said the following. I never wanted to be president. I always thought, oh, all politicians want to be president. He said, no, I did not want to be. I wanted to be Speaker of the House. But then Vice President Agnew uh, resigned in a corruption investigation, and all of a sudden, Nixon had appointed Ford Vice President. Then the tapes, secret tapes of Nixon were discovered, and investigations and investigations. And he then told me, a week before Nixon resigned in August 74, Al Haig, who was Nixon's chief of staff, came to visit Ford in his vice president's office in private. And Haig said to Ford, if you promise to pardon Nixon, He'll resign and you get the presidency. I thought, holy S. So there was a deal. Ford exploded. I'll never forget this moment. He banged his hand on the desk and he said, there was no deal. I knew Nixon was finished. There was too much evidence against him. He was going to get the presidency. There was no deal. And then this is one of the moments, most interesting moments as a reporter for me, perhaps one of the most interesting I've had. And then Ford said, let me take you to the world I was living in as president. Here, Nixon resigns. I become president. And every day, in the first 30 days of being president. Every question to me, to the White House, to the political world was, what's gonna happen to Nixon? Uh, will he be prosecuted? What about the, what's gonna be the new policy toward the Soviet Union, what existed at the time? The economy is in trouble. Will Nixon go to jail? Then. Ford said, and, and this is, you rarely get what I would call total mind entry into somebody you're interviewing, but I had been doing this for hours with him, as I said, seven times. And he said, look, the perch of the presidency, all of a sudden I had it, and you see the world differently, not through the political eyes of your own political interest, but what is in the interest of the country. And from that perspective, uh, I realized I had to get Nixon off the front page into the history books. And uh, I could pardon him. The Constitution gives the president the power to pardon anyone. He could pardon all of us, and it's not reviewable in the courts. I published this. Caroline Kennedy, the daughter of the late President John F. Kennedy, called me up and said she and her uncle, Teddy Kennedy, the senator, 
from this state, Massachusetts, had read my conclusion. And she said, we agree we're going to give the Profiles in Courage Award to Gerald Ford, not for being a politician or being president, but for the single act of pardoning Nixon in the national interest. And so uh, they had this ceremony at the Kennedy Library. I did not go. I watched it on television. Now, what a cold shower. What a moment. Here, back in 1974, I was convinced the pardon was the ultimate corruption and deal. Then you look at it through the lens of history 25 years later, and what seemed like conclusive corruption turns out to be the exact opposite courage. You cannot have this experience in my business without reflecting on what else we don't know. What else do I get wrong? The important lesson I've tried to remind myself over the years, assume nothing. You may not have it right. It may take time, and time is the important element here. So after studying presidents, Nixon, Trump, now Biden, my view is that the job of the president can be explained and answered. And that is, the president must determine what the next stage of good is, a major is for the majority of people in the country and uh, develop a plan, not a majority from your party or from the interest groups, but if we spent uh, time, we could come, what's the next stage of good for this country? It's definable. Uh, so with the turmoil in the world, it is important now, more important than ever, I believe, you don't withdraw. Stay engaged. Look for a chance to find and help each other establish that next stage of good. Play a part, either small or large. Pitch in in some way. Catherine Graham, the renowned publisher and owner of the Washington Post, uh, back in the 70s, she was the leader during the Pentagon Papers in Watergate. Uh, Catherine Graham once said about journalism, and I hope what she said turns out applying to you. She said, to love what you do and feel that it matters. How could anything be more fun? Thank you very much. We shall now present the candidates for degrees. Associate Provost Grills. Mr. President. Mr. President, I have the honor to call for the presentation of the candidates for degrees as recommended by the faculty of Boston University schools and colleges. And to all the candidates for degrees, as your school or college and your degree are called, please rise and remain standing until all the schools and colleges have been called. Mr. President. Professor Preston. Mr. President, I have the tremendous honor to present the 2022 Arvind and Chanda Namlo Kilachand Honors College Scholars. Mr. President. Dean Park. 
Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Ministry degrees recommended by the faculty of the School of Theology. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Divinity, the Master of Theological Studies, the Master of Sacred Music, and the Master of Sacred Theology degrees recommended by the faculty of the School of Theology. Mr. President. Dean Leone. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy in Orofacial Skeletal Biology, the Doctor of Science in Dentistry, the Master of Science in Dentistry, and the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies in the Clinical Specialty as recommended by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Dental Medicine degree, also as approved by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Mr. President. Dean Delva. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree recommended by the faculty of the School of Social Work. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Social Work degree recommended by the faculty of the School of Social Work. Mr. President. Dean Entman. The faculty of the School of Medicine are enthusiastically present their recommended students for the degrees of Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Science, Master of Arts, and Doctor of Science. Mr. President. Dean Abnaja. Mr. President, I have the honor to present candidates for the degree Master of Management in Hospitality, Certificate in Advanced Hospitality Management, as recommended by the faculty of the School of Hospitality Administration. And Mr. President, I have the honor to present candidates for the degree Bachelor of Science, as recommended by the faculty of the School of Hospitality Administration. Mr. President. Dean Galea. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Public Health, Master of Public Health, Master of Science, and Master of Arts degrees as recommended by the faculty of the School of Public Health. Mr. President. Dean Chard. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy and the Doctor of Education degrees as recommended by the faculty of the Graduate School, excuse me, of the Graduate School of Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Arts, Master of Science, Master of Arts in Teaching, Master of Education and the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study as recommended by the faculty of the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. And Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the various bachelor's degrees recommended by the faculty of the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. President Brown. Dean Young. I have the honor to present the candidates uh, for the Doctor of Musical Arts degree as recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. <laughs> President Brown, I also have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Music, the Master of Fine Arts, the Master of Arts, the Opera Institute, the Artist Diploma, the Performance Diploma, the Graduate Certificate in Graphic Design, and the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies as recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. And finally, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Music, the Bachelor of Fine Arts, 
and the Bachelor of Arts degrees as recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. Mr. President. Dean Unwachi Willig. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Laws in Taxation, Master of Laws in Banking and Financial Law, Master of Laws in American Law, Master of Laws in International Business, and the Master in, in the Study of Law and Taxation degree, as recommended by the faculty of the School of Law. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Juris Doctor degree, as recommended by the faculty of the School of Law. Mr. President. Dean Slatova. I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Science, Master of Liberal Arts, and the graduate certificates as recommended by the faculty of Metropolitan College. <laughs> and Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Science, the Bachelor of Science, and the Bachelor of Liberal Studies and the undergraduate certificate as recommended by the faculty of Metropolitan College. President Brown. Dean Nishan. I have the great honor to present to you candidates for the Master of Arts and the Master of Global Public Policy at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies. <laughs> President Brown, it is my great privilege to present to you the absolutely wonderful candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degrees in Asian Studies, European Studies, Latin American Studies, Middle East and North African Studies, and International Relations at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies. President Brown. Dean Moore. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. Mr. President, I also have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Occupational Therapy degree, the Doctor of Physical Therapy, the Master of Science in Athletic Training, the Master of Science in Human Physiology, the Master of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics, and the Master of Science in Speech-Language Pathology, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. And Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. Mr. President. Dean Eisenberg. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. And Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degrees of Master of Science and Masters of Engineering as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. And finally, Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. President Brown. Dean De Cristiana. <laughs> President Brown, I have the honor to present the candidates of the Master of Arts, the Master of Science, and the Master of Fine Arts, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Communication. And Mr. President, 
I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts, the Bachelor of Science, and the Bachelor of Fine Arts, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Communication. President Brown. Dean Fournier. <laughs> President Brown, I have the honor to present to you the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy in Business Administration as recommended by the faculty of Questrom School of Business. <laughs> President Brown, I have the honor to present to you the candidates for the Master of Science in Management Studies the Master of Science in Business Analytics, the Master of Science in Mathematical Finance and Financial Technology, the Master of Science in Digital Technology, and the Masters of Business Administration as recommended by the faculty of the Questrom School of Business. <laughs> and President Brown. I have the honor to present to you the candidates for the Bachelor of Science in Business Administration as recommended by the faculty of the Questrom School of Business. Mr. President. Dean Skarloff. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree, recommended by the faculty of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Arts, the Master of Science, and the Master of Fine Arts degrees, recommended by the faculty of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And last, and certainly not least, Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degree, recommended by the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and by the authority of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts given to the trustees of Boston University and entrusted by them to me, I hereby confer upon you the degrees that you have earned together with all the appropriate honors, privileges, and responsibilities, in token of which you will be granted diplomas. My congratulations to you all. Before you are seated, I would like you to salute your parents. Your accomplishments are built on the support of your family. Please turn to face them and acknowledge once again their role in you reaching your goal today. Please be seated. The commencement ceremony celebrates the achievements of each of our students, but it means much more. It celebrates the accomplishments of a great academic community, a community where you have studied and worked together in classrooms, laboratories, and studios. It celebrates not only your accomplishments, but also the efforts of the faculty and staff whose dedication has helped lead you to this marvelous day. On your shoulders rests the enormous responsibility for guiding America and the world and for addressing the substan substantial challenges we face. You are the future for this university, for the country, and for humanity. Among the graduates today are those who are commissioning in the armed services of the United States. 
You have chosen to dedicate yourselves to the protection of this country. This university is proud of you and gives you our sincerest thanks. Wherever your tour of duty may take you, Godspeed. To the class of 2022, as you leave Nickerson Field, you join a long line of Boston University graduates, stretching over time to include some 252,000 living alumni of this great institution. Your accomplishments will be part of the fabric of our legacy. Your Boston University education has prepared you well. Go into the world and make it a better place. Congratulations and good luck. Will all faculty members, graduates, and their guests rise as Mr. Ryan Van Fleet sings, leads us in the singing of the Clarissima. Words and music may be found on page 20 of your program. And following the Clarissima, please remain standing for the benediction. The Reverend Dr. Robert Allen Hill, Dean of Marsh Chapel, will now deliver the benediction. Following the benediction, the 149th commencement of Boston University will conclude. We ask that graduates and guests remain at their places until the platform party, the faculty, and the Alumni Council have left the field. Thank you. May the teaching of John Wesley keep a cool breeze blowing through our lives each and every day. Do all the good you can at all the times you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. Do all the good you can. May the, may the prayer of John Wesley keep a cool breeze br br blowing through our lives all this and every day. Tireless guardian on our way, thou hast kept us well this day. While we thank thee, we request care continued, pardon, rest, O Lord. Grant us thy peace. Grant us thy peace. Grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen.